Hello, and welcome to another episode of 20-Minute Playbook by Outlier Academy, where we decode what iconic founders, renowned investors, best-selling authors, and outlier thinkers have mastered, and what they've learned along the way. In each episode, we dive deep to uncover the tools, strategies, habits, routines, and hacks that we can all apply in our own work and lives, all in about 20 minutes. I'm Daniel Scrivener, and on the show today, I'm joined by award-winning designer and entrepreneur Joey Cafone. Joey is the founder and CEO of Baron Fig, which is known for its incredible pens, notebooks, and journals like James Clear's Habit Journal. He's also the author of a brand new book called The Laws of Creativity, where he breaks down creativity into 39 laws that anyone can follow to become more creative. You can find a searchable transcript of this episode, as well as our episode guide with ways to dive deeper at outlieracademy.com slash 141. That's outlieracademy.com slash 141. Please enjoy my conversation with award-winning designer and entrepreneur, Joey Cafone. Joey, I am so thrilled to have you on 20 Minute Playbook. Thank you so much for joining me. Oh, Daniel, thank you for having me, man. I'm excited for this. So I'd love to jump straight into the questions on this portion of the interview. Um, and I'd like to start out with a recent fascination. What have you been fascinated or obsessed by recently? What can't you stop thinking about? Yes. Uh, my wife will tell you I have unfortunate obsessions that come and go in waves. And one that's been really bugging me, and I'm just throwing big ideas out at the beginning here, controversial even, which is the uh, juxtaposition of uh, skill and renown. And so, you know, I'm writing this book and I, I could I could give a crap normally about an audience that I personally have, because that's what Baron Fig is for. However, you know, I've heard over the years, hey man, you need a personal brand, whatever. But there's this idea that I can be the greatest and the most creative person I know. And actually, I feel like I am. But that doesn't equal the greatest following. So, and then you have the the opposite, which this is what really bugs me, is you can have someone who is actually like just a half, half-assed half creator really just spewing out stuff that's actually detrimental to people's creativity, but they have the following. And so what's what's kind of getting me going these days, driving me up, is that I'm now I'm on a mission. Now I'm on a mission to take them down, to, to prove I want to compete. I want to beat people up, you know, metaphorically speaking. And this idea of skill and renown is something that is really driving me to understand and explore more. It's so well said. And, you know, I don't have many thoughts to add, except that if you do end up finding out the root cause of that, I would love to know because I've noticed that myself as well, too. Uh, and it's it, it's tough. It's tough, especially when you put so much energy and effort into what you create. I want to switch tacks and ask a very different question. Uh, you know, if people listening could shadow you for a day from the moment you wake up until you go to bed, as creepy as that might be, uh, just kind of a fly on the wall, what do you think they would be most surprised by? And I think what I'm looking for here is something unique about your routine, the way you work, the way you live? Uh, I think it just, it, broadly speaking, they'd be as, you know, I'm going to follow a creativity guy around. I think they'd be surprised at how much discipline there is. Uh, I go to bed at 8.30 at night, get up at 4.30. I uh, you know, exercise, meditate, read. I play my trumpet uh, and I do you know, a host of things, including writing. And then I go to work, right? And I kind of treat it like Kobe, you know, treated practice before practice. And I think they would be surprised at that because we, there's a stereotype of creatives, which is flying by the seat of their pants. And I'm here to tell you that that's absolutely not. And we need to separate that from what creativity is. We need to decouple this ridiculous stereotype so that more people can blossom creatively. Was that something that was always natural to you? Or have you had to work at that super intentionally over time? I think I've, it's a great question. Uh, I've only done what's natural ever, and I think it's my greatest strength and my weakness. I have been absolute, to pull in some D&D terms here, chaotic good is probably where I am. I failed 15 classes in college, didn't give a crap at all. I've gotten in a lot of trouble in my life, and then I discovered design, and it flipped, and I worked all the time, and I directed that chaos into powerful discipline, I suppose. Um, and I've been you know, specifically tracking my habits. I know it's a big thing now, uh, but I'm going on 13 years of tracking like every day, you know, 
tens of thousands of habits or whatever. You're user one, I'm pretty sure. <laughs> Dude, I'm way back, man. It all came from a book. Do you remember uh, the, I don't know if they still make them, highlights that were in the doctor's office for kids? No. Oh, they had the, the well, it's a highlights magazine, at least up over here where I, I am in New York. And I read something about, I forget what it was. And I was like, oh, I could do that. I'll just, I'll make a little grid and track my stuff and boom, it stuck. It's fascinating. <laughs> yeah, it all came from highlights, which I don't, I, I don't think I, I, anyone will ever give that answer again. I want to ask a question about Baron Fig. You're the founder and CEO of Baron Fig, which makes some of the best notebooks and pens uh, in the world, um, including uh, James Clear's Habit Journal, uh, which rose to fame over the last couple of years and came out of his incredibly popular book, Atomic Habits. What are your favorite Baron Fig products? What do you use daily and what do you love? Yeah, great question. So aside from the obvious ones, like the Confidant Notebook and the Squire Pen, because those are really at the heart of what we did in the beginning, and I'll always have a soft spot. And James Clear's journal, I personally designed myself with him. Um, so of course, there's you know feelings towards that. But actually, my favorite product that is you know, non-obvious is the Strategist Index Cards. Um, I took index, index cards, I did a very small upgrades. I put a dot grid on one side, blank on the other. I rounded the corners so that they don't get all frumpy real quickly. And these have become really the cornerstone of how I operate every day. Each one of them, I mean, I'm, you know, creativity is the practice of ideas. And each, each one is an idea on a card. And then you're able to hold your ideas and move them around and hand them to people and rip them up. And it's just a wonderful tool. And it's eight bucks. Can't beat that. And that's basically your to-do list for the day? Yeah, it's, it's my to-do list or it's ideas. So I, I just grabbed from the ones I have a repository that I keep of uh, things that I want to keep thinking about. And so you can see there's, I don't know, a couple dozen here where I'll just sit down on a Friday and go through them all. And, um, you know, ac- intention, accidents. I mean, I don't even know what this says. But, <laughs> but it's like, you know, where, where does this come from? I've got no clue. But that's the beauty of it. They're like ideas. You don't have to have them perfect uh, and ready to go. And this is why I really like them. That's so cool. I've never come across that that product. I was going to ask if you wouldn't mind sharing a little bit of the backstory behind uh, the James Clear Habit Journal. Because um, I guess what I was curious about there, one, I didn't know you designed it. So that's a fascinating thing. I think I'd love to hear a little bit more about. But two, uh, in so many ways, it seems uh, like it, you know, inevitable that along with this habit book should be some sort of a habit tracker and why not have something that's physical. But it, I think for some people, they might be surprised that Baron Fig made something that was, so, you know, so focused on a book, so focused on a habit practice. Talk a little bit about the origin of that product and the relationship with James Clare. Well, James is a cool dude, uh, definitely a, a weird guy in, in a good way. And we'll talk about um, in the full podcast, you know, how much I love weird. And James is a unique character. And I was invited to a retreat. I met James. The whole group, it was on um, somewhere in Colorado, the whole group got altitude sickness. Got a bunch of bunch of people in their prime of their life, like 30 years old, all just so fatigued. We can't move. We're on, we spend the whole weekend on the couch. And I got to know James. We kept talking a little bit. He invited me to dinner when he was in New York. And he started talking about this habit stuff. So I knew nothing about James Clear. I alternate between my silo and, you know, paying attention to things and when I need to, I control the information that gets to me in, a, in interesting ways. But anyway, I didn't know James Clear at all. And that was a, a benefit because I had no clue who this guy was or what he was about or if he was established or not. I just liked him. And I think there was a little bit of the reverse. And I and he was talking about this habit journal. And I said, dude, at that point, I'd been tracking my habits for like eight years or whatever it was. And I'm like, man, there's nobody better to help you make this thing than me. It's like, I don't care if you choose me, but I am the man for for this. So I can bring this to life. And so you know, we left it at that. Eventually, he emailed me. He was like, cool, man, let's do it. And it was a process of maybe six months uh, just emailing back and forth. He'd send me some ideas. I'd whip it up. I'd, send, I'd add my ideas, and it went back and forth. And it was almost casual because he was writing Atomic Habits at the time. And so I, I had to sneak it in. Of course, I had a ton of things going on. So such a low-key development, and then all of a sudden it was real. 
And he had, I didn't ask about Atomic Habits. I didn't know it was called anything. And then he released this book and all of a sudden everyone's talking about it. I'm like, who the hell is James Clear? <laughs> so uh, it was wonderful. It was nice. And I'm glad it happened that way because um, I think we were just able to talk as two dudes, not two dudes who do X and, two, and X and Y. And we made a great product. And, you know, of course, Atomic Habits is a bestseller and the Habit Journal is a bestseller. And it's just a pleasure. Yeah. You guys have it on your website in the bestseller section. Hope to yeah. see more, more collaborations like that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, we also have, just speaking of author collaborations, we have a new journal of write about writing with Roxane Gay. And this thing is sold out already into early in its, its lifespan. So I'd recommend anyone check that out as well if they're interested in writing. That's amazing. We'll add both in the show notes and uh, make sure people look at them. You're also the author of The Laws of Creativity, uh, which is about to come out. It's available for pre-order now, and it's uh, published by Baron's uh, Baron Fig's new imprint, Baron Fig Circus. And your book has over 400 pages of incredible stories, principles, examples, practical tools. So I'm going to ask an impossible question <laughs> to try to put you on the spot a little bit, which is if somebody came to you and said, hey, it's amazing you got this 400 page book. I've got like two minutes or a minute or 90 seconds. Can you try to just get across the gist of creativity or kind of what I should take away from the book? How would you distill down the laws of creativity? And again, apologies for asking you the impossible question. Yeah. For people out there who don't know, Daniel sent over the questions for me to ponder. And I appreciate that. And I thought about this one the most because I want to, you know, want to share good ideas. And I came to a conclusion, a very clear conclusion. Can I distill the book to a few principles? No. It's a book of 39 laws and each is important to the whole. It, it, it's like trying to distill the dictionary, right? It, there's it, the way I wrote it, the way I intended. However, I can boil the book down to a few ideas to share, which is that you are more unique than you realize. And creativity is not magic. It's reproducible and reliable and you can master. And if you asked me, Joey, okay, you can't tell me how all these laws work in two minutes. What is creativity? I would tell you simply, it's the practice of ideas. That's it. It's a great encapsulation. I mean, I think that gets across a lot of the you know important points in the book, which we're going to talk about in depth in a second. Switching gears, I'd love to talk about areas where you have an edge or a superpower. And I know superpower may feel like a loaded term, but you know you are an award-winning designer. You've, <laughs> you've done a lot of amazing work. Uh, when you think about what might be your superpowers, what comes to mind and how does that show up in your life for your work day to day? You've asked this question many times. What is your superpower? It's a great question. And I mean, to, to be super honest, maybe the most striking answer is uh, simply because, you know, and I've heard several guests have basically paraphrased, you know, it said this to me, and so I'm paraphrasing it for a bit, but have said that it's really hard to try to identify your own superpowers. So they just lean on what other, other people have told them. And something I've heard a lot from other people, um, it's typically when I'm working with a founder of a startup or a designer on a design team, is I can, in a really short amount of time, kind of grasp the big picture and the big idea and can start to make connections and to start to be helpful in terms of helping them think about that idea. And so I would say that's something I'm uniquely good at. And the only counterpoint there is I think a lot of people struggle with just understanding an idea and you always have to understand an idea to be able to engage. So I think just by a lot of design work, a lot of trying to understand complex things to make sense of them, um, I happen to be good at that. Wow, that's cool. I'm glad you answered that. Thank you for sharing. I like that you also said people uh, often say, well, I can understand it through other people's comments about me. In my case, I don't feel that way. I feel like I am really good at a ton of stuff. And, I'll, you know, I'm going to be upfront with you. Why is because I, you know, we're going to get serious here. I was raised by a single woman, my mother, and she passed away when I was 13. And I had no cheerleader after that. And so I had to become my own cheerleader and it was a tough time, but it taught me a lot about um, being confident about being, uh, if I don't tell, if I don't say it, no one is at this point, you know, there was no one to bring home a test to, there was no one to win an award and show to. So uh, I do have a, but I do have a bunch of unique skills. Um, one of my personal favorites is the ability to apply what I learned. And I know it sounds silly when you think about it, but I'll read a book and I can remember everything that I read in the book and then I can apply it. 
and uh, I have no problem taking a book and making, you know, half a million bucks out of it just by the ideas. And they're very clear to me. And I immediately see the grand picture, a lot of like what you said. So the conversion of knowledge into action is something that I don't see very often. And I think that's one of my uh, specific abilities. The other one is the ability not to take anything seriously. Okay. I, 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 for a point in my life, I had to sleep out of my car. Okay. And that's totally fine. But man, does that give perspective? And nothing really matters as much as having a bed to sleep in and food to eat and someone to come home to. And so what that has done for me is I, I can take a ton of what I wouldn't call risks and other people would because I don't see it as risky. I know what rock bottom really is and it's not what most people think it is. And that has given me an edge, a big one. I mean, those are beautiful stories. Thank you so much for sharing those. I mean, I think your mom would be incredibly proud if she could see what you've built today. I appreciate it, man. Thank <laughs> you. Baron Fig. <laughs> I want to ask a question about values and standards. And, you know, I think as a, as a creative, you know, as a designer at heart myself, my, my background's in design. I think, you know, this idea of values and standards, uh, you think about that a lot as a designer, because so much of your work is about the standards that you hold yourself to. Um, so the question I wanted to ask is what values and standards you bring to your work every single day. And this could be the work you do personally. This could be the work working with your team at Baron Fig. What comes to mind? Sure. I'm going to keep this one short and sweet. Uh, the most important value of Baron Fig, aside from ones like respect and trust, which are fundamental human standards, so I'm not even, it's not even up for discussion, right? This, the standard, the expectation that we have for everyone is one of experimentation. Everything we do, we have to understand, is an experiment. And it's small things like, hey, we're going to try this product or that, sure, whatever. But it's also things that affect uh, the team's life, like, we have a four-day work week at Baron Fig. That was an experiment last September that we ran September through December with the understanding that if it didn't work out, we were going to go back to five days. And we laid out what that meant for the team in terms of success and failure. And we're very upfront. This, I, I'm, I'm candid with my team in the sense that I don't want to work five days if I could work four. I'm not an addict to, to my office chair at all. Um, but at the same time, we have a job to do. Apologize for the siren out there. So um, experimentation, that's the value. I love that value. I also, you know, just reflecting on that, just thinking about it as you were saying it, uh, what comes to mind is, you know, I think as a, as a designer, you get very comfortable with experimentation because that's how you, that's how you land on good ideas. It's how you find great ideas. But what I've noticed is that most people that, you know, I think don't have that relationship to experimentation can be very uncomfortable because I think they interpret experiments as nonstop change. And so they have this almost immediate adverse visceral reaction to doing experiments and then being an experimentation culture. Do you have any tips for people or, or have you done anything with your team to try to get them comfortable with experimentation? I explained the premise of why we look at it that way. It's that we're not going to get things right at the first try. Right? And human beings, for some reason, our logical side understands completely. Daniel, I know I'm not going to get it right the first try. I mean, you, you're, a, you're a designer, not that we're unicorn creatures here, but you understand, like you said. But at the same time, when we don't get it right, or when most people don't get it right on the first try, even though logically they know they shouldn't, they get discouraged, they get disappointed, they get frustrated. And... I have open conversations with my team all the time about what that means, um, especially back when we first started. Now it's sort of ingrained as new people come along, everyone sweeps them up in this. Um, so really just keeping, keeping an open dialogue. And the other thing is I share my failures. and I, I'm like the first dude to share failures at Baron Bank. Like, Look at the crap I just made today. Look at this garbage I broke. Or like if I made a bad decision that is only able to be identified, six months or a year later, like I just, even though no one's asking, I talk about it and I'm like, oh my God, I wish I didn't do that. You know, that's the best we did at the time. And who knows what the best we're doing today that won't, won't be good. And it's fine. If I'm not mad, who that, why the hell would you guys care? Like if I don't get mad, I hate to use this word, but if the boss isn't getting angry, what the hell are you getting angry for? Like if I'm like, no big deal, 
let it go. Yeah, well said. Well, well said. And I think, you know, by leading, by showing your own experimentation and the output that, that, that you create, good, bad, ugly, hideous, whatever it is on that given day, I think is obviously very empowering as well, too. I want to ask a question about habits. And the way I typically try to ask this question is what tiny habit has, has had the biggest positive impact on your life or work? And obviously you're someone who uh, has tracked habits for 13 years. I think you probably have a pretty interesting answer to this question. Yeah, I've had so many habits over time. The habits are basically the precursor to skills, right? And so, you know, design, right, whatever. Uh, but the one I've kept the entire time is one I call maintain. And all it is, is every day, in order to check off that box, I just do something for my personal life. It's small to take out the trash, make a doctor appointment, so on and so forth. And it sounds easy, and one of the things that I just said, but what happens is when you do it every day, you start to run out of the things that need to get done. And then you become really proactive. Like I have to check this box off today. So I'm going to go take the hinge off this door and go to the hardware store, figure out what it is and improve it, even though it's totally not necessary. And that tiny habit has made everything else in life so much easier because my personal life is not on fire. It's fascinating. I, I have a, a similar one I call level up. And for me, it's basically a challenge. I don't know. It's just, it might sound super cheesy, but um, I read a book a while ago. And one of the quotes that stuck out to me is, you know, every single day you have a chance to go for gold, don't settle for silver. And so this level up is basically a challenge to myself that I have to do something that's that I'm uncomfortable with. And so it can be as simple as it's the end of the day. I really don't want to go to the gym. If I go, I'm only going to have 15 minutes. So I've got every reason in my mind to say no, but I'm like, no, I'm going to force myself to go and I'm going to try to have the best workout I can and that and whatever amount of time I have. And it's things like that. And it, it has been incredibly powerful. Just that daily reminder of like, do something that challenges you. I love you. that. That's awesome. <laughs> so Level maybe, up. Is maybe that, add that. Did you come up with that terminology? <laughs> I, I, it's what I use. I'm sure. I mean, you know, it's, it's okay. a big world. I'm sure right. multiple people have had the same idea. Sure. No, it reminds <laughs> me of video games and leveling up and all that. That's right. Well, that's the whole, I mean, that's the whole idea It's like every day I have to do something to challenge myself to level up a little bit. I love to ask guests about their favorite books. I imagine, you know, you probably have a lot of design books or creativity focused books that come to mind, uh, but you may not. You may have uh, fiction books. You may have crazy off the wall stuff. When you think about favorite books, uh, both things that maybe people have heard of and people haven't, what comes to mind? Uh, what do you love? What do you recommend to others? Sure. I'm going to pre preface this by saying that I was an English and philosophy major and Books. This explains why you're such a good writer. So that's good to know. I appreciate it. Yeah, I ended up doing eight years of school by accident. Wow. Um, and I have a lot to say about books in general, but I'm going to stick with two specific ones. Number one is The Phantom Tollbooth by Norton Jester. Have you ever heard of it? Yes. It's, it's a, a kid's book. book. Yeah. And um, it embodies what creativity is. It's a quick read and instantly reminds you of what it thinks to be curious, what, what it's like to think with curiosity and see things in a way you don't normally look at them. And I think it's especially powerful as an adult to read a kid's book because you start to remind it about what, what you have lost. And the other one is just Radical Candor by Kim Scott because I think the world can use more candor uh, in everyday situations. I'm writing those down. Those are great ones. And uh, the Phantom Toll Booth is one that I should probably read, but I would love to buy it. We've got two little little boys. Uh, so I'm sure at some point they would hopefully like to read that book. One is for the other one's almost two. Uh, we're kind of in the counting by months phase. I don't know, but almost two. So it's, it's, it's big, beautiful. big stuff. Big yeah. stuff. Starting to, get, starting to become big boys. Very cool. Well, good luck. Thank you, man. It's yeah. Good luck is about the best advice you could give anyone with kids. <laughs> <laughs> you never know what's coming. Uh, two more questions. Uh, second to last one. What do you wish someone sat you down and told you before founding Baron Fig and or writing your book? And what I mean by that is, you know, when you set off on these, uh, set off towards these ambitious goals, uh, you know, you throw yourself into them. You also, you often don't know what they entail. You kind of learn that in the process. Is there anything you wish someone had sat you down and told you before doing either of those things? I've gotten a lot of great advice from a lot of people uh, for Baron Fig and you know, more recently, the loss of creativity, James Clear, you know, sat down with me more than once. Josh Kaufman, the author of the personal MBA, Roxanne Gay. And I've had a lot of guidance, which I appreciate. I think for Baron Fig and business for business wise, my barber has given me the best advice. Guy owns his own business. I was having a bad day. 
not not recently, thank you, thankfully. And he owns his own shop, and he said to me, "Hey, man, if you're ever not having fun at work, just change the work, because I can." And you know, I, I had almost become a victim to the idea that I had created a machine that now ran me. And he was like, "Dude, you're still this is your thing. Change it." And uh, dramatic results from that piece of advice. And for my book, the one thing that stuck with me was actually something I had heard Malcolm Gladwell said, uh, say, which was first you have to be entertaining and then you can be informative. I really like that. On that Malcolm Gladwell quote, why, why does that resonate with you? And why do you think that's so true that you can't lead with info? You know, it's almost like, yeah, it sounds like you have to disguise the information inside, you know, and it's like a junk food wrapper that people want to go and engage with. Is that the idea? It is. I think you have to give people a reason to listen before you tell them what you want them to hear or what you think they need to hear. All right. So my book, False Creativity's 39 Laws, each one starts with the story before I get into any principles whatsoever. And I'm so glad uh, that I read that from him because that was a direct result. It's amazing. Last question. If you could go back to the start of your career and whisper some advice, a reminder, words of wisdom in your ear, is there anything you would tell your younger self? <laughs> no, no. I've seen Back to the Future. I know what the butterfly effect is. I know how it works. Uh, I love where I'm at and the missteps have contributed just as much as the success. As I, I'm appreciative of where my life is. So uh, I'm going to say that no, I wouldn't change anything. If I had to speak to that, to someone to give a piece of advice, I would say that your failures are probably more important than your successes and appreciate it. I feel like that's true. I've also heard many people, you know, kind of parrot the opposite, that only through success do you learn what works. What, you know, can you give an example or think of something where failure could just contain something that was really valuable? I think it's the failure is in what you learn that didn't work is as important as not. So for example, when I wrote this book, I wrote the intro, I wrote five, six, seven, eight different intros and had people read them. And I was able to, I, I personally, they didn't know, but I had kind of broke them down into modules that I was moving around like AB tests and I could isolate through when a, a person was totally unmoved and I was able to isolate better what moved people than by what people pointed at. Cause when it moved them, there were still unmoving pieces within. So then the combination of unmoving pieces actually helped me better fit the moving pieces. Is that clear? Yeah. Yeah. That's yeah, so interesting. So that's one example. Yeah. It's a great example. Thank you so much for joining me on 20 minute playbook. Uh, it's been great to have you on Joey. Daniel, thanks man. Appreciate it. Thank you so much for listening. You can follow Joey Cafone on Twitter at Joey Cafone. That's Joey C-O-F-O-N-E. And you can subscribe to his newsletter at joeycafone.com. You can also see all of Baron Fig's incredible products at baronfig.com. You can find a searchable transcript of this episode as well as our episode guide with ways to dive deeper at outlieracademy.com slash 141. That's outlieracademy.com slash 141. For more from Joey, listen to episode 141. 42, where we explore his new book, The Laws of Creativity, which includes 39 laws that anyone can follow to become more creative. You can find that episode at outlieracademy.com slash 142. That's outlieracademy.com slash 142. For more from Outlier Academy, follow us on Twitter, LinkedIn, and TikTok. Subscribe to our YouTube channel at youtube.com slash outlieracademy, or visit outlieracademy.com for more incredible 20-minute playbook episodes. We'll see you right here with a brand new episode next Tuesday.